Welcome to your universe. Okay, everybody, welcome to the show. Richard Sachs. Richard is the host of Lost Arts Radio and um, someone I just got turned on to by a listener named Emily. So thank you, Emily. How's it going, Richard? Great. It's nice to see both of you guys. It's great to see you too. Glad to have you on the on the podcast. I know it's going to be a good one. Yeah, it was a real treat to find out about what you're doing. So. Uh, Haley was listening in with me on Saturday night when we checked out your live show where you were um, speaking about the the teachings that uh, that you share on your Saturday night broadcast. And I think a great way to introduce the concept was something that you spoke about in the beginning, which is that all great spiritual teachers or who you might call even prophets are channeling the same consciousness. And so in a way, it's not unlike them being the same being. Yeah, that's right. The reason it seems really different is they're tuned into that one teacher to different degrees, you know, because obviously there are some of them that are saying really radically different things, but I still think there's really only one real teacher and they're all just more or less successful at, at tuning into that. Yeah, that uh, I, I feel like whenever you're getting into the flow of um, – self-reflection with another person that teacher is almost like a third person that comes into the conversation and helps both individuals raise their awareness to perspectives that you wouldn't really even be able to generate without that sort of trinary uh system going on yeah i i really agree with you i think one way that i might put it is that that teacher or that being is really the only one there and voluntarily experiencing itself at different levels of awareness. But in yeah. the end, it's going to be the only one. That's uh, kind of cutting right to the chase that I wanted to get to, which is uh, just to talk about the, you know, the, the thing that we can't repeat enough, really, which is that this really is the subjective experience of infinite consciousness that you're having right now. And that we are all having, sharing the same uh, reality dream because it is all the same being. I think that's right. This is what we, you know, intentionally decided to do. It's not not like we were sent here by somebody for any kind of punishment or anything. It's it's our attempt to experience a different environment, and we had to project it as if you want to get right down to it. It's a holographic projection of consciousness what we consider solid reality. So we don't have anybody else to really blame anything on. It's all us. In the quantum mechanics realm, you have the idea of observer phenomenon having an impact on, on events. And I think that anybody that wanted to look at this concept in their own life, how what you think can create uh, experiences for you, really all you should do is just um, pay attention, right? Like keeping a journal, really. If I was keeping a journal the last couple of days, I could have noted that on one day we spoke about re- wanting to see a friend that we hadn't seen in months. And the next day we ran into him and uh, let's see, what was the other one? Oh, um, I was needing a, now this may or may not be <laughs> a synchronicity, but I was needing a pair of Bluetooth headphones for whenever we're rock climbing because it's hard to bring my phone on the wall uh, for regular earbuds. And just to keep the phone away from your head whenever you're having a conversation. Right. So um, we came across this set of Bluetooth earbuds on the ground. So if we don't find an owner, I guess I got that right the day after we, I was talking about needing it. And then yeah. um, our another friend of ours would try to get a hold of us today and I didn't see his message, but he was wanting to meet us in, there's a, a butterfly house at the park that we go to and he was wanting to meet us in the butterfly house. And today we usually take our walk in a big, um, across this big cow field and it, it's like a big, bike trail well today we decided to go to the park instead and we went into the butterfly house and sure enough we ran into him so it just happened (laughs) yeah it's fun when that happens huh actually i think it's happening all the time and it's just we forgot making the arrangements but i don't think there's anything that comes up by by uh just random you know uh 
I hate to use the word chance, but I, I don't actually believe in that. I think everything is exactly organized. Uh, yeah, chance does not exist. I mean, there's a lot of definitions for chance that I like to throw out there besides the typical one that people think of, which would just be like luck, I guess. Um, right. Which, uh, For one, chance is the absence of law. And I don't believe that there is ever an absence of law. Cause and effect is always in effect as a concept, as are many other principles or spiritual natural laws. And uh, you could also say it's the absence of concept. That is a definition that I prefer because if I think of myself as conceptless, then I am better able to take off the external skin suit that I'm wearing and place it on the shelf and listen to and absorb open-mindedly the moment that I'm in and what it's trying to teach me without getting um, in the, my own way through my own conceptualizations of what I think that I already know. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that's all programs anyway. Yeah. I don't know. Sometimes I do wonder um, going with us being sort of a, uh, all a part of the dreamer's dream, I guess you could say. What about what's going on outside of the dreamer? What if it is this just minefield of uh, probability with no sort of causation completely opposite of the world that we're aware of right now? I mean, you never know, but that would be a really crazy place to be. I like it here where it does feel like you have some sort of, um, you know, you you get what you put out. (laughs) Yeah, I I think... There isn't any, well, I mean, I don't know, but from from the little bit that I've experienced, I don't think there's any place that's not perfectly organized. And it's just that it's more divided into polarities here than it is closer to where we came from. Mm -hmm. As we get back closer to there, away from here, it gets a lot more harmonious and centered. Here, you've got all the opposites antagonistic to each other, and it's what's keeping this level going. But it's just an extreme imbalance at the moment. It doesn't have to be like that. Mm -hmm. What I like to keep in mind, though, is that all the other levels are actually right here in the same place, the same eternal now, and that there isn't, um, there's no distance either dimensionally or um, in space time between us and the spiritual higher realms or the lower density realms, um, other than the barrier of perceptual separation and that's all that there ever was to begin with so um getting in tune with the present moment does though and mean that you can see a greater range of potentials but you also start to see um deeper chasms of darkness and um i guess this is something i kind of wanted to bring up with you actually uh because i i am pretty sure that you have a strong familiarity with the dark occult, um, dark solar cult that essentially through a network of various, you know, secret societies, religions, and uh, unknowingly satanic organizations has a stranglehold on our existence at this moment. But how do you, how do you bring that information to others without uh, you know, because you're a very measured person, and I know that you are good at conveying information in a way that is, if it's going to get through without uh, offending somebody, then you're the guy to do it. So, like, how do you, <laughs> how do you do it without triggering people in their, uh, you know, I, I could bring up a specific example, but I want to get your take first. I think one of the things that is helpful for me is that I, I feel like I'm only here to share certain information with people that want it. I'm not here to convince anybody of anything. And I'm not here to debate and argue because I feel like that is a tremendous destroyer of energy. And it doesn't get anywhere because, you know, in a debate, the main purpose of each side is to show that the other guy's wrong. Mm -hmm. And, And so if they're not there to learn, what are you doing? So I don't feel like I need to convince anybody of anything. And and most people are not consciously ready to get into all that stuff. They have to resist it because it's too scary. You know, it threatens their whole identity and their picture of reality and everything. And I don't think we'd necessarily help them by disturbing that. So I'm looking at other ways to help those people that are not on the direct 
you know, confrontational level, but they're more silent and they're more powerful and they won't even know why they start changing, but I think they will. Uh, what you said actually really got through to me. Um, there's not any purpose to sharing that uh, politician X is involved with ritual child abuse and murder. I mean, like anybody that's not already tuned into the fact that that kind of information exists or willing to accept it is going to reject everything else you're pro saying probably too, if that is something that you share. Um, there and are, there are people that are ready to look at that. And with them, sometimes it's helpful to clarify what's going on on that level but not for the people that don't want to know. Right. That just turns them off to other uh, things that could actually help elevate their consciousness. And then if their consciousness is elevated by some other aspect of a message that you're able to share that they're willing to receive, then naturally they're going to get a wider view of what's actually going on. Yeah, I mean, we don't have to emphasize the stuff that's really threatening. And I, th I think one, one thing that is um, helpful is to work on encouraging the stability of people first, because if they get a, more of a sense of themselves, they're less threatened and they're able to look at more. So you introduce them to the concept of mind and what that is. And see, I have a little bit different take than the people in the hermetic document that you sent me, which, which is very interesting. And we can talk about that if you want to also. Love to. Yeah, but I wanted to get your take on the mind because I've definitely been playing with the idea, um, which yeah, I'll let you explain it. Um, but my, my takeaway from listening to you the other night was that I could start seeing my mind in a relationship like it's uh, an external person that is also a child and that likes to play games and that will, if it's bored or it's mistreated or it's put on the wrong tasks, it will have a bad output, kind of like a computer. But if you're able to uh, make friends with it, it will work for you in a sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that whatever I say now is not, you know, any kind of ultimately true thing. It's just sharing where I've gotten to so far and we're all on, on the the, you know, in the educational process, but just in case it's useful, what I've seen at this point is that mind and spirit are not the same thing. I mean, everything is spirit ultimately. Okay. So really it's all the same thing. You could say a wheelbarrow and spirit are the same, but what I mean is they're not in the same state. So mind, as I've seen it is something that we projected ourselves as a separate entity in order to deal with three-dimensional reality and a couple of levels above it. It's not the ultimate state of ourselves. And it has a, a self-awareness. It's totally conscious, but it has a personality like a little kid. And it's a little kid that we, as the parent, who are living in the body and supposed to be going, using the mind, we abandon it. And it, it doesn't like that because it, it has the the feeling of a two-year-old kid. And so you let the two-year-old kid run around the house and fend for itself for your whole life. And it doesn't end up being a very good situation. And this is a little kid that also has, I mean, to say it had nuclear weapons is a vast understatement. It has, <laughs> it has access to all information on, on this level. And so everything that the psychoanalyst people and the psychiatrists see as this vague, vast area of the unconscious, that's all conscious to the mind. It has access to all of it immediately. So it's, if it's abandoned, it has no maturity and no wisdom. It's like a little kid. And it wants our attention because its main desire is the love and approval and appreciation and attention of the parent, which is us. And we didn't give that. So it's running around tearing up the house we're thinking that all the all of the programs that it's playing, which are thoughts and emotions, are ours. They're not. They're just programs. So instead of having to analyze them, as soon as you see them as just programs, like the mind is playing them on the, a CD player or something, you're suddenly vastly empowered because you know that's not you. And then you make friends with the mind 
instead of what the old yogis did, trying to overcome it by force. And when you do that, it becomes your ally and everything changes. To me, <clears throat> to me, it's like um, maybe the concept of artificial intelligence that's so huge in the last decade, especially, but has been really this entire century. Um, maybe the artificial intelligence is that everyone is seeking to create that is leading us in the, the, uh, the transhuman people towards what they consider the singularity point whenever it's created. Maybe that's actually the creation of the mind itself whenever we as spirit created this essentially uh, shared network of information storage and analyzation uh, that we all tap into from our individual uh, you know, hardware platforms that we call bodies. But like in this conceptualization, I could see it as that the mind itself is the same operating system that we're, like we're all using the same, uh, just like everybody's on the same type of smartphone. We're all on the same, we're all on the mind system here. Right, except that in each one of us, it has a separate state of being and personality. Based so on programmed parameters and customization. Yeah, and your particular history, it's been with you for a lot longer than this lifetime. So it's, it's tied into your history and what you've done and what you've decided to do. And the other guy or the other girl that has been dealing with their mind, they've had a different history of what they've done. So they, act, they don't act the same. And they may have access to the same pool of information, but the personality of that conscious mind is unique to you. And it's somebody that you have to make amends with and make a new relationship with. And when you do that, yeah, it can access the same information that everyone else can, but everyone else is not doing that. And the people with who are playing the part of bad guys right now that are making a big mess on this planet and elsewhere, they have their own mind and their own mind is playing programs that they think are their own thoughts and emotions and ambitions. And they haven't recognized that separation. And they're doing it as if it's what they want. But theoretically, they could be waked up just like we can. And once they do, and they heal what's going on with their mind, they're just like us. That wake-up process, as you were talking about in the broadcast that I checked out, which I highly recommend everybody go listen to uh, Richard's work. You can find him on YouTube at Lost Stars Radio. But um, you spoke a lot about how much, how essentially every human ill and every aspect from aging to um, psychosis can be healed by reconnecting to source energy, by strengthening the tether towards the you know, the direct center of the mandalic universal mainframe, if you will. Um, but what I, something I wanted to say when I called in, but I didn't actually get around to it was actually that that process, while for some people can have been in a really quick and clarified way and they shed and discard many layers of illusion simultaneously, um, there's always more layers and every, every shedding period is, is different for every person. So essentially there's not like a end all be all now I'm woken up. It's more of a, a process that you stay within and continue in the flow of it perpetually rather than all of a sudden being at some arrived state of perfection. Yeah, I would agree that it's not just, you know, two positions either, you know, you know, everything or you don't know anything. And it's not like that. It's, it's more of a, graded situation where you're always making progress in one dimension or another and you're learning whether it's supposedly good or bad experience they're all educational but i would also say that in order for the physical healing to take place it's not just on the awareness of spirit it's also what we do on this level that also has an effect so there are things to do here. For example, on the really mundane level, if we're eating processed food and GMOs and drinking fluoride in the water and stuff like that, no matter how spiritual you are, that affects your body. And the reason that people don't notice it is there's a time delay. On this level, things are so slow that the cause and effect are separated. 
And it's kind of lucky in some ways because we do so many self-destructive things. If they were instant, we might have a lot more trouble. But even the physical level things like, you know, what you drink and eat and breathe and how much sunlight you get and all these things have definite effects. So all the levels have to become consciously uh, harmonized, I would say, for good that, result. That's something we talk about all the time, that the, although consciousness does generate reality, your physical brain, your physical body has an impact on that consciousness still. Yeah, your experience is really heavily dictated by um, that kind of trifecta of body, mind, and spirit. So you have to get all three of those things to as um, you have to constantly work to optimize those things or they don't work together well. Yeah, exactly right. And and I think body and mind happen to also be self-aware conscious beings in themselves. And body, for example, has a different personality than mind. It's much more steady and it's got some more maturity, even though it's still a kid, but it's an older kid. And it's been trying to communicate with us since before we were born. And we've been ignoring it, most of us. But it could be giving us information that's way beyond any medical lab. And I'm not saying that this is medical advice. Don't worry, you guys. And everybody should go to the doctor immediately and get all possible drugs and everything that they need to get. But this Take is all the shots. Ask for extra. Exactly. Extra mercury, please. We would never want to get in the way of any of that. But the, but the thing is that just for sharing information, which at the moment is still kind of legal, I would say that the body is a being in itself, just like the mind is. We're pure spirit, which is not mind. And if we start relating to the body, like the parent to the child, it's going to be helping us so much. I mean, it can give you feedback about physical things you're doing before you even do them that are going to save you from all kinds of mistakes. And I think that's valuable. Yeah, there's even scientific evidence that demonstrates you are actually, I think this is research done by Dean Radin. I could be wrong about that, but uh, there's and it's definitely a repeatable experiment that you can put someone in front of a screen that's going to show a video of something uplifting or terrifying or sexually erotic. Name it. Name something that will have a physiological effect on the person who views it. And that physiological effect is actually measurable. Um, milliseconds before the person actually sees the screen, they begin to have the appropriate reaction. So... Yeah. That is coming from, I believe that research determined that that's coming from electrical signals originating in the heart that send the system, the nervous system, the information to have the reaction that it has. So in that sense, our body is actually connected to um, the present moment and that which it's flowing into so deeply that it knows things before we do, as you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Everything's known all the time, right, you know, in the immediate present. And and this illusion of passing time is um, it's just a movie. So there's access to everything now. And I, I think everybody is in their real state beyond some kind of a movie superhero. So the the turning around in a positive direction of things in the world, you've got more than 7 billion real life superheroes hypnotized into thinking that they're helpless zombies. And if they realize that's not exactly accurate, then all of the, a lot of the distress that's going on now would change. Yeah. The hypnosis is real though. How many people did you see on their phone at the park versus not looking at their phone when we were walking around? Um, I would say most people were on their phone at the park even. Amazing. Yeah, that's been a real successful program. Especially Pokemon Go. Everyone's playing Pokemon Go at our park. Yeah, still. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was a psyop to figure out how many people they could get to download a game that was not even a game, that was totally devoid of <laughs> entertainment. Yeah. Well, it's not only that. It's also that if they need a, a surveillance of a certain area, they just project a certain treasure or monster or something there. And everybody goes for free and checks it out for them. They don't have to hire anybody to go uh, film it. I know. It was, uh, it's a perfect example of how the population are enslaved, literally slaves, and they don't realize it. Um, because what does a slave do? Whatever the master tells them to do on cue. 
without even questioning it. Right. And uh, the mental programs that we think are our own thoughts are a big part of it. Yeah, like the program that says, hey, I remember Pokemon. I want to do this. Yeah, yeah. Or just or the one that has gotten used to thinking, critiquing other people constantly instead of ever looking at itself. Oh, yeah. Um, that could be applied to this situation right now as I'm critiquing these individuals for being on their phones. I'm <laughs> by no means am I some kind of champion of eternal present moment awareness. Far from it. And um, just keeping up a basic daily meditation practice and um, qigong and stretching and, uh, you know, the calisthenics necessary for my body to work correctly. Just that is a big enough challenge for me at this point point because on the subject of slavery i am still um still connected to the federal reserve debt note that we call the dollar bill to the point of needing a certain number of them a month and having to work regular employment i'm really interested in ways that people could make their living doing something they like instead of the current situation where most of them can't stand their jobs the ones that have jobs and i think there's ways to change that I'm really interested in that too. And in fact, like the entire reason that I want the, like the, the intent of this show for being helpful to other people is to show individuals like yourself who are uh, boldly, bravely being themselves and following what spirit is actually calling them to do and um, making it. <laughs> That's the, I like, I like that type of example. I appreciate the, the role model that you are for, many individuals, I'm sure. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more of your teachings in the future. Yeah, I I really, you know, being publicly visible is not something I had intended to do at all. And I ended up being, you know, I I started this research in health and consciousness stuff uh, and what's going on in the outside world in the mid 60s. And it was just quiet. I mean, because very quickly, I got into stuff that I knew was totally forbidden information. And a lot of people have been killed for mentioning even tiny bits of it. And I didn't really feel like doing that. I just wanted to keep exploring and more and more because it's rewarding in itself. And I completely changed my own physical body and everything I learned, I did on myself, which was the way to see what it feels like. Um, But then I was a guest on a doctor friend's show in Chile. She was in Chile at the time. And there, the other guest was Dane Wigington, who was a researcher on geoengineering. And he had a show called Geoengineering Watch Radio at the time and asked me if I would please be a co-host on it because I knew about that topic with the spraying and the chemtrails and stuff. And I felt like I couldn't say no because people who wanted to learn about that needed the information. So I was on there and I was on there for about eight months. And then um, that was over. I was leaving and I was going to disappear again. And the radio network owner said, will you please do a show on health? And again, I felt like I had to do that. And then everything just came together by itself. So it became obvious that apparently it was supposed to happen. And that's still going on. And I think if enough of us are speaking these forbidden things like the fact here's a good one you don't actually die there's a forbidden truth (laughs) um i think if enough of us are speaking things like this then uh it won't matter if any of us are silenced the same being will continue to have life which will be the one great eternal mystery spirit that we're all emanations from Exactly. And if we just are open to doing whatever we need to do, that just becomes our lessons and our school for ourselves, right? Can you can you tell us about the nature of some of the revelations that you've had in the, the Essene teachings? Yeah, I when I was born, I had memory of some of the time before this lifetime. And not complete, but enough to really affect me. And one of the periods that I remember is the end of the Essene period, as it's called, or about 2,000 years ago when this teacher named Jesus was walking around. And, of course, there there was no Christianity or anything, and the the religious people were the ones that were trying to stop him all the time. But he was actually teaching um, 
mostly things that never got into any official scripture because they weren't acceptable to the power structure that uh, several hundred years later kind of decided what would be told to the people. Um, he was telling about where we came from, that he was totally connected with all the time and that he was and still is. And he, and he was also talking about nature and how to take care of your physical body and a lot of really uh, other non-physical entities that are friendly, that you're connected to, that you can re-establish uh, conscious relationships with, uh, that were called angels, and also the consciousness that's in the earth, which is really interesting because even though that's a big UN scam, it's also true. And both at the same time that there is consciousness in the earth and sun and basically in everything because it all came from consciousness. So he was teaching about that and how to get back in harmony with it and how to use that even for physical health problems at the time. And so, and I ran into a little book in 1975 called the Essene gospel of peace book one. And the energy in that book reminded me of things that happened then more and I spent a lot of time over the next 40 years or so adapting what we used to do then to how it could be applied now in a different environment. And um, I'm still involved in that. So, Oh, that sounds really like I should check out the, the scene gospel, actually, because there's one thing I've become aware of with uh, Christianity is that the exoteric story is – not only a cover story that is meant to keep people from uh, higher truths, it is the same one that they've been using for thousands of years in all kinds of different forms. It's astrotheology uh, skewed into a historic, a pseudo historical narrative. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I have to be really respectful of everybody's religion and philosophy and say, um, again, I'm not trying to convince anybody at all of what to think, because I think you have to find that in yourself, because that's where the connection point to your source is. It's not in the outside world, although there are clues there, because that comes from the same place, too. But I just have to share what I remember in case anybody finds it useful, you know, and, and what I remember is that it wasn't about religion. <laughs> the teaching wasn't about religion. It was about reality and about who you are. And it wasn't, you know, I'm really great and you guys all have to worship me and I'm God and you're nothing. And it was not like that. It was, you are the source in a not quite conscious form yet. And here's how you start to fix that. And there are laws of nature, which on the physical level have to do with like what you eat, for example, which is very important. And it was taught then too, because people were making mistakes in what they ate every day and it was making them sick. But it's also true that there are laws of nature on a, on a deeper level that whatever you think toward other people, your intent for them, what you wish for them every second is what affects them and it also simultaneously affects you. So you have to get to where you're sending out just incredible wishing of good for everybody, including the people who are doing bad things because they're not any different than we are. And that's the fastest way to help wake them up. Even if you don't say anything, it doesn't matter. So that was kind of, it was incredible experience and it was like being in this aura of, complete stillness and it's not like the religions that have to say well he's the only real teacher all the other guys are wrong it's like he was a really good manifestation of the only teacher and there are others all over creation because they don't leave the all the planets and places in the universe and other universes they're all fully populated and those guys are not left without teachers it's not like earth is the only place and that's just physical universes there's a lot more besides that so this one teacher is all over the place and he was just a good conduit for it yeah um on other planets there are <clears throat> likely 
life forms are just outside of the spectrum that we're able to see. I mean, light has an infinite wavelength and we're looking at a tiny sliver of it able to perceive with only a few different apparatus. Right. And, you know, light is just our concept. There are things way beyond that even. And there's also things that are here, beings that are here. Most of the beings that are here, which to me are just people, are not physical and we don't see them. It doesn't mean they're not real. Most of them are really happy to communicate. And if your energy that you are cultivating is really light, the bad ones don't hang around you. So you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, they match the frequency of a person. That's actually how you, um, not unlike the way that a person opening up to source energy becomes sort of imbued with a higher consciousness and almost is not themselves anymore. Although they are themselves, they're their true self. They're yeah, not their lowercase s self. The right. same could happen in reverse with uh, with individuals, and that's where you see a lot of homeless people at, where um, because they've got a negative frequency trapped in their expression, something that matches that, uh, what you could call hungry ghost, maybe from the Buddhist um, perspective, can attach and even overtake their decision-making. Yeah, this is an effect, side effect of drugs, you might say, and other things, other kinds of trauma and things that weaken the person's you know, connection to themselves attracts those less friendly beings. And it's a good reason to learn other ways to have a good time other than to get drunk or, you know, do things that decrease your consciousness because those make you vulnerable to the influence from other things like that. And even entheogenic substances and psychedelics can risk that because um, they can amplify the vibration that you are uh, putting out or that you're choosing and that might even make a larger and brighter beacon to something that you don't want to find you if you aren't using those type of substances in a conscious way. I would never yeah. tell someone not to exercise freedom with their own consciousness, but I would actually encourage exploration and consciousness. I would just encourage it from a grounded, centered, and um, knowing that you are safe. And it's actually not that difficult. Um, the entities that you're describing as angels – We've actually had experience with um, protection from metatronic energy over the last year, and it's been felt, it's been visualized, it's been um, since we were made aware of the level of protection, if you will, it's just always remained in effect. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I would encourage people to learn that even the natural substances, so to speak, um, are not required because what you have in yourself is so far beyond that. It's like when I was in university as a student in the 60s, everybody was using LSD and marijuana and things like that, not really trying to zone out as much as they were trying to explore, like you said. And people were using peyote and now they're using ayahuasca and stuff like that. And those things can have really incredibly great effects in the short term. But what I've seen watching it for decades with the people who have done it is that it leaves points of vulnerability that it make the people tend to fall down and have to start certain parts of it over again. And if you do it in a way without those things, that doesn't happen. And I, I just think that's nice if you can do it that way. Yeah, you have to always avoid what's known as spiritual bypassing. You can't just um, decide that, I guess you can't just, you can in a way decide to be, you know, done with certain patterns of behavior and, and things. But um, what you're saying about being open and uh, leaving vulnerability or vulnerable points. I've, I've heard of people getting entity attachments or holes in their aura or energy sheath of protection um, in their non-physical body from just excessive use of one thing or another. So it is, 
it is something that is worth exploring because in my opinion, I still believe that it is because of the fact that you can be shown what some of these altered states of consciousness are like, and it helps, it can help you move in that direction on the natural side of things. Absolutely. And even, even every once in a while to, um, just to open that, that door a little wider to crack the uh, third eye open a little more. There are times and places where that could be very applicable and um, useful and not going to be harmful. It's just, I think what you're describing is when someone thinks that it's like a medicine that they need for their own wholeness or completeness, as opposed to, um, which in a way almost makes it a type of addiction, as opposed to it just being a preference, something that you would use if you could, but you would never non, uh, you wouldn't use it in an, a non-conscious way. I know of a person I was thinking of that used LSD and just once or a couple of times, maybe 30 years ago, and was really opened up, like you said, to some amazing things that were really there. I mean, they were real and they were very good. It's just that because of doing that and getting that quick help to see things they weren't really ready for, 30 years later, they fell, and not using drugs anymore at all for a long time. Because of having done it that way, they ended up falling right back into complete confusion and anger and self-doubt and disconnection from all the things that they had seen and had to start building it up the regular way by, you know, one step at a time without the help. And I think that's what I'm referring to, but I'm not saying that that path is wrong because everybody gets to choose exactly what they want to do. I'm just kind of observing that it may seem quicker and smoother in the beginning, but that's not the whole picture. And that's all. And it really needs to be said to, especially to possibly um, a large section of my listening, listening audience is probably involved with the music festival world and transformational arts festivals. And um, that culture has a strong current of, substance use and a very large percentage of that group of people do use their substances in a at least semi-conscious way but um it is also a form of spiritual bypassing that leads people to burn out just as quickly as they turned on if that makes sense so it is it's definitely important to bring up as a a real potential pitfall that someone could take because there's really it, it has to be you that's doing it. It can't be the substance that's doing it for you. So if you are bypassing in that way, it's probably inevitable that there will be a form of boomerang effect. If somebody feels like they need to do something through <clears throat> drugs, then they probably for some reason need that experience. But I've just noticed like a lot of them, for example, the widespread use of marijuana. I've been watching that since the early 60s. And it definitely dulls consciousness. And I think that makes it useful in certain circumstances because, for example, if a person it tends to be violent or really unstable and um, can't really get centered, it dulls the energy enough so that they don't tend to hurt people or get in flying to rages and stuff like that. I've seen that many times. Um, in addition, people having totally out of control physical um, nervous systems where they're having seizures, it dulls that down a lot so that it can stop the seizures. And if they're having a lot of pain and they don't know how to get rid of the source, it can make them not care about the pain. And the pain kind of seems to get a lot less. So those are, you know, apparently good effects, but it has a, first of all, if you want to, you know, from a health point of view, if you want to take in marijuana, I would recommend never smoking it because your lungs are designed for fresh air. And I know that's politically incorrect with a lot of the guys you're talking about. <laughs> but physiologically, it's absolutely true. And you, you don't want solid particles going into your lungs. But I would also say that the use of this particular herb is very dulling. And it makes you think that things are really cool when they're not. <laughs> and you have to be kind of outside the picture to notice that. And I... I was a musician, still am, and at the time in college, I was in bands and things like that. And I noticed that 
the musicians really thought that their music was getting incredibly good, you know, on marijuana. And anybody on the outside would say, whoa, you missed a whole bunch of those notes. Did you not notice? And it, it was just pretty interesting, you know, to observe. Well, it does require, it definitely something that would require balance if it was going to be incorporated into someone's life. My personal experience with it as uh, ex- definitely an experienced person <laughs> is yeah. that there is both an, uh, an expanding and heart opening potentiality with it. And there is a dulling potentiality with it. And yeah. it is very similar to the other substances in that it's pertaining to why you're using it. Um, like if it's something I would just be using to get through the day and using really, really um, heavily, I would say it's almost full time. The entire time I'm using it, it's dulling me. But yeah. if I have that's what you want too, because people get into it in that kind of situation to not be so sharply aware of what's bothering them. And it's really a theme through any kind of drug use, whether it is a drug, a non-physical drug, even of, you know, doing a certain kind of relationship where you're taking advantage of other people to take the attention off yourself, or you're doing alcohol, or you're doing cigarettes, or marijuana, or whatever. It's to not be as irritatingly aware of things that you don't feel good about, and so it makes you calm down. But you sacrifice the clarity. It's true. Yeah, and that's a way of ignoring what you know in the present moment needs to change as well. Yeah, which I don't blame anybody for that. It's kind of hard to deal with those things, you know. <laughs> but I, I'm just saying, if you get to the point where you say, look, I'm tired of blowing away the time. I don't care how much better it makes me feel. I want to get through this stuff in a way that is solid and real and stable. And at that point, it's harder, but... It's like when you go to the gym and and you're exercising with weights for the first time in 30 years, it feels pretty weird. And there's types of pain that are actually good, but they don't feel good when you're just starting. And you keep having to go through that. And it's, it's kind of an interesting sequence. But the results are great. You get very strong. So... Uh, you would you would recommend that someone's going to get through their experiences more efficient, efficiently and effectively as sober as possible. I would say the only people that I can work with in what I'm bringing right now are the ones that are ready to not do any of the substances, because you don't know what you have to solve if you're using those things, and if you don't, you are going to be faced with it. You you know in a way that may seem almost impossible to deal with, but you're going to know there's something there that has to be dealt with. And all these substances are helping you to not be aware of that. So for me, you know, I finally got to the point where um, I, I don't even want to eat a kind of food that's going to distract me. I mean, I want to know, and I'm going through it because I got the feeling there's something great on the other side and I don't want it later. I want it sooner. So I don't care what it is that I have to go through. And it's like the, in the fairy tales, there's always a dragon in front of the pile of gold, right? Whatever that symbolizes. And it's really true. And the dragon is the discomfort that makes you want to not be sharply aware. And you have to say, you do what you want to me. I'm, I'm going straight through. And at that point, there are things that can help you and it gets exciting. And it's almost like some, you know, supernatural story that you get into and you start realizing you are the character in the fairy tale, you know, whether it's Lord of the Rings or whatever, um, those have real counterparts and we're actually superheroes, all of us. And we don't remember, but we still are. Um, I, that was beautiful, by the way, <laughs> I, I agree with all of that. I'm, I feel I'm like a, I'm explaining it really badly, but I hope it's getting through. No, uh, it's like, actually, this is, um, a perfect, this is perfect for me to be hearing right now. I don't, I hope that it's good for anyone listening, but this is what I needed to hear right now. That's <laughs> what's beautiful about the conversation. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask what your take is on, uh, 
supplements and, um, you know, yeah, let's just go with supplements as a catchphrase. Sure. Um, I spent about 20 years working with supplements and taking different combinations and different dosages of different ones. And um, I got a lot of benefit. What I'm doing now is a little different because I finally realized, well, a couple of things happened. One is that I started seeing um, flow agents and these little tiny ingredients that are in there that are not the supplement that you want. And it's just for the formulation. And I started looking into what some of those are. And I also, um, I went through different stages, you know, about 1970, I started experimenting with being vegetarian and um, later on became uh, vegan and later on became raw vegan and found out the long-term pitfalls of, you know, the various different things. And it connected to what we were just talking about. Um, I wanted to know, wait a minute, what is the body really capable of doing using natural substances, foods, you know, without as much as possible without supplements? I wanted to know. And so I started experimenting with that. And I also had to find out what is wrong with raw vegan approach because almost every single one of them that's done it for a long time they become like a escapee from a prison camp. I mean, they're really skinny and they're usually cold and weak and unstable mentally. And in fact, Matt Monarch, who we've had on the show, is um, in agreement with this, or at least he was, that most people, he said, shouldn't do it because of exactly what I just said. And I, went, I said, wait a minute, if something is naturally designed into nature, it has to work. And if it's not working... We're not understanding it. And I remembered in the Essene period that we had used raw milk. And the vegans say that milk is one of the most evil things in the universe, or at least the galaxy. And so, you know, but they're not paying attention because the government is trying to eradicate it. And the government doesn't try to eradicate any food that's not wonderful. Because why would they waste the time? You know, they're trying to eradicate raw milk, that is. That's what I'm talking about. And yeah. the, the vegans do not differentiate. They say all milk is evil. So I realized that, number one, we used it back then. For, and there was a reason, maybe not huge amounts, but we did use it. And it's in the Essene Gospel even. And, um, but I remember it without that. And now, when they describe all the evils of milk, they're talking about pasteurized, you know, dead material from cows that are chemicalized. They're eating usually GMO food. They only live a few years because they're made to produce way more than they should. And, you know, they're in tight quarters. It's totally inhumane. It's nothing like what real milk should be. And so I thought, well, I'm going to try it. And I had all the symptoms of what you call lactose intolerance and got all this congestion that the vegans talk about and everything. And I said, wait, my body's really clean at this point after fasting and juice fasting and raw vegan stuff. I need different bacteria and enzymes in my gut or I'm not going to be able to use the milk. So where do they come from? Not a pill. They come from the milk because the milk is what inoculates the gut of every baby mammal. And then they build an entire body out of it. It's one of the only things in nature that is only, its only purpose is food. And so um, I just stuck it out and I waited. It took about two or three months and then the congestion went away. The gut uh, microorganisms got balanced and I never had any more bad symptoms. Plus I regained about 30 pounds of muscle and got all my stability back and my uh, resistance to cold. Um, I bathe in rivers in the winter now and it's fine and I haven't, I have no desire to ever go back to cook food. So I don't use supplements anymore because I don't need them, but I do use iodine for the moment until I can grow all of the food myself because the mineral content in the soil, which comes 100% from rock dust, that's the only source on the planet for like calcium and magnesium and iron and all that stuff. It comes only from rocks. 
And if the rocks are not powdered, the soil can't use them. So there's a way to grind up rocks and mimic the fertility that existed right after the Ice Age, which is when it was high, from grinding up the rocks with the glaciers. And um, if you do that, you can grow food that is a superfood. And I think that we'll be able to not use iodine then too. So I, I look at the supplements as a great stopgap measure. But when you get cleaner and you get nourished, you just about don't need them at all. How long have you been eating raw? I have so many questions. Dang. <laughs> oh, <laughs> how long have you been eating raw? And when did you add the milk in? Um, I guess the last experiment with any little bit of things that was cooked was like six years ago. So since then, it's been 100%. Um, and uh, what are your thoughts on eggs? Um, I don't see anything wrong with eggs except for the fact that they, ha you know, they have to be eaten raw or you have the same problem as with other cooked food. They're most the life force is destroyed. But raw eggs don't appeal to me very much. Um, they just don't seem appetizing. I mean, you have to hide them in something else. And so to me, there's something, I don't want to eat stuff that I don't like how it feels to eat. So that's my only complaint is that eating a raw egg doesn't really sound very appetizing. I agree with that. Um, the chickens don't mind, by the way, if you take some of their eggs. I've had chickens. They're really nice animals. They'll jump right in your lap for being padded. And they will eat eggs in a second, too. They have no, they don't get depressed if you're taking their eggs or anything. But it's just that they don't seem very appetizing. I guess that's the only thing. So I don't use them. And there's no need for them. I mean, I, I'm doing an experiment right now um, because all the raw vegans are so, mostly, are super light and skinny and weak. And people have the complaint that, well, look, you know, the, People getting ready for movie roles, you know, and the movie stars, and they have to look really good and strong and everything or play superheroes. They, all of them, eat meat, steamed vegetables, and brown rice or sweet potatoes, and that's it. And with slight variations, but almost not. And they look beautiful, but they are eating things that are going to later on set them up for diseases. And so I want to prove that you can build tremendous strength and, and vitality and everything on the raw vegetarian diet. And I'm in the middle of working with that now. I, uh, I'm very interested in this approach because I've been highly suspect of the way that veganism has been so zealous, zealously pushed in the um, mainstream, usually things that are attached to the quote unquote new age movement that are pushed really heavily although they might contain a lot of good information and good points within them, there's always like a, they tend to be cul-de-sacs before the gold mine, if you will. Well, and you, you know, you have a real warning sign if the United Nations says that veganism is good. You, that guarantees there's something wrong with it. Absolutely. But it's just not necessarily obvious what, because I totally agree with the vegans about not abusing animals at all. Of course, definitely. That's like paramount. Yeah, it is. It because the animal is totally conscious, emotionally, you know, aware of being, and it's just like killing your pet dog. It's just because it's in a plastic package doesn't make it different. And, and when you find out that you can actually stay in really good shape, and I hope that I'm going to find out, you can probably stay just about as strong as those super strong meat eating people in the movies. Um, that's going to change the whole picture. I've been a uh, vegetarian for about a year now. Thanks a lot to um, Haley's influence in terms of actually, although you're not going to like this word, learning how to cook <laughs> vegetarian meals. Yeah, um, yeah. And now, you know, I'm sure you would agree though, that uh, even though we're cooking food and your, uh, your research has shown that raw is the way to go, it's obviously a big step forward to be um, moving towards or to be completely organic, non-GMO, uh, yes. vegetarian fed. And so anyone that's listening right now that's like raw vegetables only and some milk, that's not going to work for me. Well, like we were saying, the enlightenment of any aspect of yourself is likely not going to be instantaneous. And you can 
you should make steps in the direction and um, using that character called your mind, program it with the thought that I don't want to be a part of animal cruelty and suffering anymore and let that thought be programmed in there. And then even if you continue eating meat or if you have the intention that that's not what you want anymore and you have that thought programmed in there, it's going to get harder and harder to keep making that decision. And you're naturally going to change if you have changed the program. I, I think I have a different opinion on that because I feel like once you know something, if you don't take action, it's just, it's, it's ignorance. That's what it is. It's ignoring it purposefully. And um, I think that like in the case of meat eating, for example, the second that that light bulb goes off in your brain, you're like, wow, these animals are being slaughtered inhumanely and it's causing them a lot of pain. Um, I think cold turkey, I think, I think cold turkey is the way that everybody should go whenever we realize something like that. Ultimately. I agree with you completely, but the fact is, is that not everyone is going to do that. That's true. Unfortunately, but on terms of moral and karmic standpoint, I believe that your karmic culpability does increase once you have conscious knowledge of something, not just unconscious. See, there's also a way that we can make it easier for people to get there. Because if they have an interest in that, but they're not ready to do it, the more they learn about how consciousness works and play with that in themselves, not just memorize it. For example, when you eat food and you feel really satisfied and you really like it, this is subtle, but I think people can gradually understand it. It's not the food you're after. It's the feeling of happiness and satisfaction. That's a big difference. And you can apply that to anything that you use to get a certain feeling. So once you realize that, you're not necessarily as addicted to the means of getting there. And what happens is as you connect to other levels of yourself that you didn't know about, you can get there directly, and then you feed your body whatever you think is good for it. You, it. You're happy regardless, and you're getting more satisfaction at that point than you were eating the most fabulous you know, cooked meat that you can imagine. You actually enjoy it more. It's not self-deprivation. And if you get that little change in perspective, the need for willpower to do the really hard cold turkey stuff is gone and you can do it without effort. So I'm trying to help people do that. And look at the meats that are typically, at least, okay, here in the United States, the meats people typically eat are beef, chicken and turkey, fish, um, maybe pork and possibly some people eat lamb. Then there's weird stuff like, you know, crocodile, but you know, those are the standard kind of meats. Yeah. And how many items did I just list? Maybe five or six. If you cut five or six items out of your diet, look at the hundreds and hundreds of, of produce items or just food items in general that, that could be replaced with. I mean, the possibilities are nearly endless. Well, yeah, you can make really appetizing food so that it's not so difficult. But at the same time, if you learn about these feelings and these thoughts that are controlling you, they're all programs. And if you start observing that and realizing, I, I know this is a big step, but realizing that those are not you. And as soon as you even get the slight feeling that that could be true, the empowerment that comes into you, it's just like a flood. And you start seeing things differently right away. And everything else gets a lot easier. And then you start looking at your body like your kid, not you. And how much willpower does it take to feed your kid what you think is good for him or her? It doesn't take any. Mm -hmm. Because it's your kid, not you. And if you get closer to that point, the need for willpower is over. It's a then, you're also expressing true self love at that point, um, yeah. not just uh, se selfishness, but it's uh, selfless self love. And, and you know that so it's really interesting point that you bring up too about selfishness and selflessness. That dichotomy was invented by religious authorities. <laughs> they said whatever you want is bad, 
and whatever you are is bad. You know, you're just a totally worthless sinner. And unless you do what we say, you're doomed. And really, the truth is that they weren't telling you. Everybody in all levels and places in creation is 100% selfish, and there are no exceptions. It's just that the wiser ones understand that their self is everybody. Mm-hmm. And so they love to do things for everybody else, and it's doing things for themselves because they include everybody. But they're, yeah. all, they're all selfish. And that's what's great. Uh, that's why the universe works in that fashion. Um, it's, to, it's not to make you all of a sudden burdened with the responsibility of taking care of everybody else uh, because they're you also and they're your children or something. It's actually because, you know, you will get the same experience as what you put out. Yeah, if you are helping others, then you'll be always helped. You just spontaneously want them to be happy. And it's then not, spontaneously, because, they want you to be happy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not because of some, you know, philosophy or logic. It's because it's like when you see a, a little kid um, who's upset and you have some way to give a, a toy or make it happier. You just do that. It's not a business deal. And that, that's how you start seeing everybody. It's just uh, pathetic. Um, it also reminds me of the hermetic principles that I emailed over to you that, uh, the Kybalion, which I've talked about on the show before, but the Kybalion is a set of seven principles that have been around for a very long time that, no, you know, there's no such thing in written language as an actual end all be all law, but these principles seem to be, um, observable and in effect in our reality. And, in the uh, principle of polarity, I think that's where you, and the principles of cause and effect, those two combined are where you have a description, a good description of what you're talking about, which is just um, getting to the source of what makes you happy or satisfied instead of having an external thing being, uh, being the cause of that, you get to be your own cause of that. And whenever you see the polarity arise of dissatisfaction or, um, I guess dissatisfaction is the the best catch all word. Uh, you're able to transform that from the source level by um, knowing that it's not you exactly, like you're saying. You since it's not you, you can just feed it a different program and just say, "Oh, um, this simple meal uh, of." Even if all you can get that's raw and uh, vegetable is just a plate of greens, that's going to satisfy me. You you tell yourself that, program yourself with that information, and it's true. I know this because um, most days for lunch, I don't even prepare a meal so much as I just graze on fruit and greens and nuts and just eat that. Uh, And it's super satisfying, trust me. It is. It tastes good. Give me one second to turn on a light. It's just getting a little dark in the room. Oh, yeah. Five seconds. I'll be right back. We've actually... We've actually gone past the time that I, I told you I'd keep you, but if you're um, willing to speak for a few minutes, I would love to talk more about Lost Arts Radio. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm okay. I don't have anything immediate, so whatever you want. Great. Um, so with with Lost Arts Radio, um, what is your full intention with that at this point? Because it seems like there's kind of two things going on. You're interviewing people, and that's going ranging the gamut from what you could call conspiracy facts to uh, healing modalities. But then in your, your personal show, it's, I've I've only got to catch one episode, but it seems kind of like just a free form. um, Let spirit move and speak about what is needed to be heard right then. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the first show that we started with lost arts radio was the guest show that's on Sunday nights. And, you know, we've had, um, really amazing world-class guests from the first day and it's anything related to health or and or consciousness and that covers just about everything so um, that's still going on once a week and then about six months ago um, I get a lot of input overnight when I'm sleeping and 
I was told one morning before I woke up, you've got to start this other show. It's got to be called Church of the Essene Teacher, uh, relating to the teacher we were talking about. And you have to start talking about what you've been doing. So I figured I didn't have any personal desire to do that. And I just figured, okay, that's what we're going to do. And I don't, sounds pretty weird to call it a church show, but that's what we'll do. So that's where that came from. And I'm starting to talk about the kind of things that we're discussing here. But we also take calls from people dealing with difficult health situations or um, life situations. And we're talking about the two levels that what you can do to transition from where you're, and this is just information that we're sharing. We're not telling people what to do or medical advice. We say, again, you know, go to your doctor immediately, you know, get, get all the drugs and everything. But what we're telling them that in this way of thinking, there's a continuum, like a line, and it's got junk food on one end, and it's got what you really need for your body on the other end. And if you are in fairly decent condition and you're not really dissatisfied with where you are, you can just start moving gradually, you know, get rid of the processed food, um, start using the whole foods, get rid of the non-organic food and stuff. And you move more toward vegetarian as at your own speed. If you're in a really life threatening situation, that's already gotten bad then my opinion that I'm not telling anybody else to do is that you have to jump to the other end of the continuum right away. And you, you have, because see, all these situations involve detox and then rebuilding. And the detox is not a product. It's all based around fasting in some form, which allows the body to start doing its own detox it doesn't need a product. It does it. It knows what to do, but it, it's energy is tied up dealing with food right now, day and night. And so as soon as that stops, it knows in the 20 to hundred trillion cells that you've got, where are the deposits of poison that are causing trouble? And it starts with the most recent first, and it moves toward the older ones and it starts throwing them out. And as you throw them out, their effects go away. And that's the basis of almost all physical healing in, in the real sense. You can get a boost from somebody really advanced touching you or thinking about you or looking at you. But if you don't correct what's going on physically, you have a relapse. So the way to make it stable is you have to change the elements in your lifestyle. But before you do that, you've got to go through this detox process. And so we talk about that and we talk about how to handle mind and body as conscious entities in a way to make it as easy and smooth as possible. You can think of it like you have to change filters in your uh, house at certain points throughout the year and your body has filtration systems that get completely gunked up, especially in the extraordinarily toxic environment that we find ourselves in currently. Um, that's actually I, another thing that I really probably needed to be having a conversation about because um, uh, last year I did a colon cleanse and it was amazing. I fasted for oh, like 10 days and uh, the stuff that came out of me was unreal and it yeah. <laughs> unreal. Like you wouldn't, it, I don't need to go into description. I actually yeah. did a couple episodes of the podcast describing that, but in, um, in consciousness, the advancement was immediate as well. Actually, in the last, yeah. the last day of the fast, I had a full-fledged out-of-body experience where uh, I separated from my body completely and was like flying around in the house and could see everything consciously and control it. And uh, I, you know, I, I guess I kind of tricked myself into thinking, oh, you did that pretty recently. You're good. But really, that's just the colon. There are a lot of other organs that need uh, cleansing and in even on a semi-regular basis, I think fasting would be something that would be a powerful tool to sharpen not just your consciousness, but also your willpower. Yeah. And, you know, even in the old Essene period, they were taught that if you're going to fast on water, but it applies to juice, in my opinion, also, that you do the enemas every day, as long as you're not eating solid food 
or until your gut is moving in the normal way, because you don't want anything hanging around longer than it has to and being reabsorbed or anything like that. Yeah. The cleanse I did um, had a herbal supplement that caused your bowels to move. And then there was a, I think it was a type of clay that would expand with the liquid inside your colon and push things out and push things through. Do you consider that to be equivalent to the enema? Like you could do something of that nature instead? No, no, no. Um, I think the water is, I don't know anything to match that and water coming in to the colon directly. And I, in most cases, I don't, feel the need to use coffee, but coffee has been shown in with cancer patients in the work of Dr. Gerson and uh, Dr. Gonzalez and other people that it opens the bile duct more than just water. And if you have a really severe situation like that, um, not only does it get rid of all this poison, but because pain in the body is connected to the toxic levels that what Dr. Gerson found in the 1930s in Germany is that the patients near death with cancer were so toxic and in so much pain from the corrosive and um, acid stuff that was in the body, especially if the cancer started breaking down, that they were getting killed by the pain pills, which is happening today also in hospitals. And that if he increased the frequency of the enemas, he got to a point where the pain pills were completely unnecessary. And a lot of these people who were almost dead recovered. So it's a powerful tool. It used to be in the Merck manual and then it got replaced by drugs in the seventies, I think. Wow. Yeah. That's something that's not really been on my radar very much. And it's an, obviously an extremely ancient practice. Yeah. They used to use gourds with, with stems that were hollow and that was the enema bag. <laughs> I'll have to do more research, uh, maybe outside of this conversation. <laughs> yeah, I don't recommend using gourds now because the the rubber bags are available just like a hot water bottle, and you can get those online. But um, it's it's um, absolutely valuable tool that I don't, I would not even try a fast if I was somebody that wanted to do that without using the colon cleansing. I uh, I'll let everyone know how that goes after I try the experiment for myself. Yeah. So, you know, if you're in a really serious situation and all these diseases, this is something that we're not supposed to know. And I'm not telling anybody what to do or not do, but I have not seen any of these so-called incurable diseases that are not completely reversible. And the only ones that get into that category that I've seen are the ones where the medicine has done, you know, too much damage and almost destroyed the body with radiation chemotherapy, which is a derivative and originated with mustard gas and World War I and all that. It's, it's not brilliant to put that kind of poison into the body, but you know, everybody's hypnotized about it now. But if, if not too much damage has been done from those therapies, then I think almost every case is completely reversible, but that's just my observation. And there's so many different ways that it can be reversed too. Um, I, I've heard, I've heard a handful of names of individuals that have come up with cures for cancer. Um, one that comes to mind was a guy named Rife. Yeah, I know about that. Right, I've used those machines. And um, from what I, this is my uh, layman's bro science explanation of it, but he would use resonant frequencies to essentially disintegrate the cancer, but it would leave the other parts of the body unharmed and it's because the cancer is at a different density than the rest of the biological matter and uh, just like you can bring a building or a bridge down if you have the right resonance to the building materials the same is true for biological material is that am I explaining that correctly yeah I th resonance is really powerful and can be used for a lot of things it's what Tesla was starting to play with and um, the only thing that I've observed is that I think Rife still had kind of a symptomatic approach because it, even if you get the exact frequency to disintegrate a tumor, it's a systemic problem and it's likely to come up again. I have seen people with the Rife machines who died from the cancer that they were trying to treat. Because they didn't change their habits and they didn't cleanse the toxicity that's 
and rooted in them? Yeah. I mean, if the body's clean, for example, it smells good even if you can't wash it for months. I mean, it's really obvious. And it's that built-up toxicity that eventually causes, you know, something to just be, you know, out of control. And if those things are not removed with the cleansing, then you can get rid of the symptoms. You can cut tumors out of the body. What happens a lot of times is they come back in the same place or they come back somewhere else. And it's a complete lack of understanding. It's like, you know, the lymph system is the um, kind of the disposal system of the body. It's a bigger circulation system than the blood system. Uh, it's about three times as big, if I remember, but it doesn't have a heart connected to it like the veins and arteries do. So it only circulates by muscle contraction, which is a reason for movement and exercise. And also if it gets um, dehydrated or just, you know, kind of stuck based on all the junk that's accumulated and it can't keep up, then the body just gets overwhelmed by the deposits and cleaning those out is relevant in every kind of disease I've seen. I mean, including mental conditions. And there have been experiments with people in mental hospitals and prisons where they've done physical detox and their interest in crime goes away. So it's really interesting how they're connected. Yeah, um, you really can't take away the mind-body-spirit connection. And uh, if if there's one thing that someone could do to get themselves it, into a better harmonious existence it would that would be completely free and that it could do every day reliably it would be um movement practices and physical grounding practices that uh, your body needs for the flow of energy through itself to actually correctly work yeah i think that's true and also to start becoming aware of the constant stream of thoughts and emotions that are flowing through your mind and recognize at least the possibility that those are just projection, projected programs and that they're not you. They're technically, they're really not even yours. They're just on a record that you're hearing. And once you even imagine that that's possible, you realize that your potential is totally unlimited and you're never by yourself. That's another thing I would tell people. That's a complete illusion. The kind of supportive love energy that you've got around you right now and all the time is overwhelming. So if you start to tune into that, even if you can't hear it or, or see it, you can communicate to it. And if your sincerity is there, things are going to happen that are really good. I think you prove your sincerity to it by practicing self-love for your own body. That's one way to do it. Yeah. And I, I, you know, it took me forever to realize what that even meant. You know, I heard from somebody that had already done it, that self-love was a prerequisite to loving anybody else. And I thought, loving yourself, I don't even like a lot of the stuff that I'm doing, you know. And I, it made no sense. And then I realized it's not asking you to be enamored of yourself because that's dishonest. You know, you're just in, in your work in progress. But it's the kind of love that's symbolized by the sun giving life to the earth. It's not based on a deal or saying that, oh, this plant is really good, so I'm going to give light to it. You just give light because that's your nature. And you're giving love as a causeless gift all the time to everybody, including yourself. And the degree that you do it to yourself, instead of judgment, instead of punishment, which everybody's involved in, thinking that, oh, I did this really bad thing, so I should suffer for it, which everybody is consciously at some point thinking and holding themselves down. You just say, I don't care what you did. The love is unconditional. You know, we're not going to do the justice thing. That's over. And it's just going to be 100% love. And at that point, you have the ability to give it to other people. The, uh, that makes me think of the, the infamous occultist Aleister Crowley, uh, who changed his tarot deck to move the position of the justice card um, from the top of the tree of life so to speak to 
uh, be switched with the love or also interpreted as the lust card. And I, <clears throat> I ponder with that idea a lot because well, I think that natural law does equate to a certain type of justice existing in the universe. Um, right, but it's not being carried out by some justice nasty god who's doing it to you. There's no emperor on top, exactly. No, there's, there's no executive own, branch. No, your own consciousness is set up so that it wants you to get to total clarity. And if you're going against that, it's going to set up the exact experiences for you to come back to where you need to, and that might be unpleasant. So it's a perfect sense of cause and effect to get you the ultimate benefit, and it looks like punishment, but that's not the reason. Well, uh, it's to show you that cause and effect actually exists. And if you if you are your own cause, you will get to that reunion with higher self uh, in a p less painful and more quick and efficient way because you are choosing the causes that are getting you there. And if you are ignoring or rejecting the truths that are being revealed to you, you'll still have experiences that will illuminate you, but they will not be of your own cause and choosing. So they are less likely to be enjoyable for sure. Yeah. I mean, everything's in your hands, basically every single person, their own fate is completely in their hands. And actually they are the most important character. Anybody listening to this, them in particular, personally, are the most important character in the whole drama of the world. And they have, you have the potential to be so powerful that you can change all this for the better. It's really, it's beyond imagination. This conversation itself exists so that you right now will hear it and make the decision that you need to make. Yeah, and everything will be all right. So in the long run, we're going to be fine. There's no way around that because we're permanent beings and where we came from, we're going back to all of us, but to make things better in the short run. So we don't have as much trauma and things start getting right, better right now. Every single person has that completely in their hands. That's beautiful. Um, I guess I'll ask you if you have any other remarks to, to speak to people and we'll close out the show. It's been a wonderful conversation. That's for sure. Yeah, I'm sorry to keep you guys so long. I hope uh, what? No. no that's, that's this has been great. This is a this has been a very enlightening conversation. <laughs> it's exactly the stuff I needed to hear personally. It's fun for me. I would just say our your normal state is of such automatic ecstatic high energy that there's no even the, the most amazing Fantasy drug could never even come close to, to the first 1% of it. It, it. It's something that you don't have to create or figure out how to make. It's your normal state. So the only thing we have to do is listen to the programs, become aware of them, become aware they're not us, and then become aware of what is around us and in us. Connect back to that, and the rest follows automatically. It, it's, it gets really good. So don't be, don't be discouraged about anything, no matter what. Wonderful. And everybody, make sure you check out lostartsradio.com to see what Richard's up to. Yeah. And um, I really feel honored to have been part of your show. And thanks for letting me hang around for a little while. Oh, uh, we'll have to do this again if you're open to it, because it's been it's been extremely on point to the exact type of conversation that the show even exists to have. So thank you so much for being a, a bright reflection of that source light, my friend. Right. Yeah. I hope you will have me back and we'll do it again soon. Okay. Uh, see you later, everybody. Well, that's all for this one, folks. 
I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Richard Sachs of Lost Arts Radio. And if you're looking to check him out, just go to lostartsradio.com or check the episode description for links to that. And also, while you're there, why not follow our link to patreon.com forward slash interverse. You can pledge any number of dollars, large or small, to support this show. All of it goes towards improving our equipment situation at the time being because there's a lot of things that we could do to improve the quality of the show's sound. And listener support is really the only kind we've got. You may have noticed we're totally ad-free. So if you want to help us grow, go to patreon.com forward slash interverse. Throw us a bone, a dollar bone. And also, like I said, thank you to Richard. He was a great guest. Had a lot of fun with this episode. And we will talk to you next week. Love you all. Please help us out by sharing the show anywhere that you can through word of mouth or social media. And also, I'd like to remind you that you can find the podcast on the iTunes podcast app where you can subscribe and leave us a five-star review, which is also very helpful. It makes me feel warm and tingly inside whenever I notice. See you next week. (laughs) 